On the night of the 24th of August 2001, a fully loaded Airbus A330 with 306 people on board ran out of fuel midway over the Atlantic. How could a state-of-the-art computerized airliner suffer such a catastrophic failure? Mayday, mayday, mayday. We have lost both engines due to fuel starvation. We are gliding now. Well, we're now at 30,000 feet at the rate of descent of 2,000 feet per minute. We have to ditch in the water. And you didn't put on your life jackets right now? Oh, this film investigates what happened to Air Transat Flight 236. This is it. This is It's over. They're just going to die in the next five to 10 minutes. And the speed's increasing, 203 knots now. It's way too fast. Everybody, I need you to brace. Oh, my God! August 23rd, 2001, Toronto International Airport is busy. Air Transat is a charter company that has grown rapidly to become one of the largest airlines in Canada. Midsummer brings fewer business travelers and a holiday atmosphere. Air Transat Flight 236 is bound for Lisbon. Most of the passengers are Canadians visiting Europe or Portuguese immigrants heading home. The plane, a twin-engined Airbus A330, is being flown by a young co-pilot, Dirk de Jaeger, and an experienced captain, Robert Pichet. Captain Robert Pichet is somewhat out of the ordinary. Captain Pichet, from the moment he gets his wing, he gets to learn how to fly in the uh, north of uh, the province of Quebec, where the conditions occasionally are very severe. The flight deck of the A330 is ultra-modern. Banks of computers connected to over 100 onboard sensors constantly monitor the operation of the plane. This film reveals how serious problems can arise when the pilots begin to distrust the computers. Before departure, the computers give no indications of any problems with the Airbus. Left on Romeo and hold short on 24 right. Roger, follow A320 Air Canada, left on Romeo and hold short of 24 right. With the crew of seven, Flight 236 has 306 people on board. Well, we were married for four days, wasn't it? Four days. Four days. Four days. So we had planned to go to Portugal for our honeymoon and we had booked this flight on Air Transat and rather quickly because we hadn't really planned what we were going to do very carefully. So this was the last flight left. Well, boarded on this flight to go on a two and a half week vacation with, with a friend of mine. Um, obviously, he was very excited um, spending two and a half weeks on the coast of Portugal. A very excited feeling. Transat 236 heavy, cleared for takeoff. 240 at 8, cleared for takeoff, 24 right, Transat 236 heavy. At 20 minutes past 8, the Airbus A330, loaded with over 47 tons of fuel, leaves Toronto for Lisbon. V1, rotate. The weather forecast for the Atlantic crossing is good. Everything runs smoothly on the flight deck, apart from a small adjustment to the route. To avoid congestion, air traffic control directs the flight 60 miles south of its original route. It's a minor alteration, but will later play a crucial role. The passengers settle down for the long crossing. Uh, the reason for our trip to Portugal was uh, a family trip. We were going to a wedding. 
otherwise we would not have gone this year. Um, so instead of just going for four days for a wedding, we decided to stay for two weeks and uh, throw the wedding in as a kind of family perk and uh, see everybody. Everything appeared quite normal. And in fact, um, I had traveled on Air Transat previously and found it not to be very good and was surprised by the quality of the flight that you know, it was on time, the plane was newer, and we thought generally it was much better than we had expected it would be. We're getting to our next checkpoint. Every 30 minutes across the Atlantic, the crew check their position and fuel consumption against their flight plan. 0.2 tons on the right, 11.2 tons on the left. Despite the computerized systems, some procedures, like checking the fuel on board, still need to be done by hand. By comparing the amount of fuel in the tanks with the amount the flight started with, the pilots can keep an eye on the fuel consumption. Fuel check complete. Level's normal for the distance flow. All right. For the first five hours, everything is routine. The flight crew, Air Transat, and the accident investigators have all declined to be interviewed about what happened next. This film uses known facts about the flight, standard emergency procedures, and expert opinion to reconstruct what took place on flight 236. Look, we're getting a warning signal. Oil temp low and oil pressure high on number two. What? This warning is the first step in the crisis. Oil pressure is within normal limits on number one. Number two is slightly high. The computer display reveals that the oil temperature is low in engine number two, but the oil pressure is high. It is a very unusual reading. The pilots are puzzled. I can't see anything here. I'll look in the FCOM. Okay. A low oil temperature indication is normally in indicative of, of bad readings and bad sensor. Uh, oil temperatures don't decrease normally, they increase. A low oil temperature would, would be of no concern. The high oil pressure is, uh, is a very strange indication. Uh, it's, it's very rare. In fact, I've never actually heard of one. It's only indicative of the contamination normally of the oil with fuel. Uh, that's not something that's explained in the manuals. Call the company. The crew contact Air Transat's maintenance group in Montreal. Transat 236 to Mirabelle Operations. Mirabelle Transat 236, hi. Hi, we have a little problem. We're getting the warning oil temp low and oil pressure high on the ECAM for engine number two. There's nothing in the QRH nor the FCOM. Can you help us out? I'm looking in the menu. The ground crew have no immediate solution. The pilots must work it out for themselves. They may have been given some advice uh, on, on troubleshooting. Uh, to see um, if that would help. But ultimately, uh, you know, the pilots are up there on their own. Uh, you know, they can get advice from somebody 2,500 miles away, but they can't really fix their problems. Suggest you keep monitoring your oil levels and see what happens. But because the oil readings are so unusual, the pilots believe they may indicate a computer error. The crew keep monitoring the oil levels. Air Transat 236 continues on track. Then, 20 minutes later, a new warning. Fuel imbalance warning. Haven't seen that before. Follow our weekend action. I have air traffic control. In the Airbus 330, most of the fuel is in large tanks in the wings. The computer has now detected that the fuel level on the right is significantly lower than the left. The crew consult the Airbus flight manual which recommends they transfer fuel through a special cross-feed valve. Fuel will then flow from one tank to the other. But before opening the cross-feed, the pilots must be sure that the imbalance is not caused by a more serious problem, such as a fuel leak. Last fuel check was only 15 minutes ago and it was okay. No indication of a fuel leak. 
Keep going. Wing cross feed. On. On. Once you begin a cross feeding procedure to correct a fuel imbalance, uh, restorative action should commence quite quickly. Uh, in other words, the situation would not continue to uh, to get worse. It would it would either stabilize immediately, and then begin to to correct itself. But the situation is not correcting itself. Unknown to the pilots, there is a major fuel leak in the number two engine on the right hand side of the plane. Flight 236 is in mid Atlantic nearly 300 kilometers from the nearest land. Thirty-nine thousand feet over the Atlantic, nearly 300 kilometers from land, Air Transit Flight 236 is in trouble. Unknown to the pilots, the right engine is leaking fuel. The plane's computer system has thrown up a series of warnings, but the pilots believe these are computer errors. Have you ever seen something like this before? No. Never. Doesn't make any sense. Hey, even if there is a leak, it doesn't explain the alarms on the oil system. Well, everything was okay at the last fuel check at 30 West. Oh. Bet you it's a computer problem. The task of finding out if there is a fuel leak is made harder by the design of the Airbus systems. The systems monitor hundreds and hundreds of sensors and, uh, you know, they can be affected by uh, you know, such mundane things as a little bit of uh, frost or ice on a sensor can, can, uh, can cause it to pre present bad data. So it's, you know, it's, it's not something that would occur on, on every single flight, but it's something that we're, we're quite used to dealing with. There is no warning to show the fuel level is falling faster than the engines are consuming it. So the pilots change? receive no immediate indication that there could be a fuel leak. Fuel quantity isn't rising in the tanks for the right wing. Check fuel quantity. It's very low. Hold on. When co-pilot Diego carries out the fuel calculations, he discovers something is seriously wrong. It's much less fuel than we should have. It looks like a fuel leak. Check again. Diego finds a disturbing difference. According to all the gauges, all the tanks in the right wing are way below the level they should be according to the flight plan, and, and there's hardly anything in the other ones. What about a trim tank? There's nothing there either. Yes? Hello, first officer here. Can you come to the cockpit, please? Sure. Although Captain Pichet believes he is dealing with a computer problem, he nevertheless decides to ask for a visual check, just in case, to see if there could be a fuel leak. Captain? Hi. Can you and Karen uh, take some flashlights and go to the windows? If you can see anything, trail him back from the wings. It'll look like a mist or a stream and report back immediately. Okay. Dirt. I want you to do another complete fuel check, please. I'm so sorry. In daylight, the fuel pouring out of the back of the wing would have been clearly visible. But in the dead of night, even with a torch, the fuel leaking from the engine is impossible to see. evidently realized that the situation was not improving and uh, at that point they realized that there's that their circumstances were becoming more serious and uh, I think that there were probably some discussions 
took place between the two pilots as to what their next course of action should be. If the computer is correct, then with the amount of fuel remaining, the Airbus will no longer be able to make it to Lisbon. Captain Pichet is forced to make a crucial decision. We've got a direct. Get onto Oceanic Control, where is the nearest airfield? Transat 236 Heavy Santa Maria Control, can you advise nearest airfield? We have a possible fuel problem. The nearest runway is over 300 kilometers away. But with the fuel remaining, Leger's military airbase on the tiny island of Tessera in the Azores should be within reach. Santa Maria Control, Transat 236 Heavy. Proceed to 30 flight level 390 direct. 350 miles to threshold. Are you declaring an emergency? Stand by, Santa Maria Control. Not yet. It must be the computer. Transat 236 Heavy Santa Maria Control, no assistance required yet. Flight 236 continues flying south for the next 25 minutes. Everything in the cabin seems normal. But in the cockpit, the fuel readings are getting worse. Must be the computer. I've checked. There's nothing in the trim or center tank. And the gauges show only seven and According to the fuel gauges, the plane is using fuel much faster than normal. Whether they believe the gauges or not, the captain has no choice. He must warn air traffic control. We have to declare a fuel emergency. Transat 236 Heavy, Santa Maria Control. Santa Maria Control, Transat 236 Heavy, go ahead. Transat 236 Heavy, declaring fuel emergency. I really hope it's a computer bug. Because if we land in the Azores with half a plane full of fuel, they'll crucify us. But at 6.13 a.m., less than an hour from the first fuel alarm. The right-hand engine runs out of fuel and cuts out. We're losing engine number two, I don't believe this. Okay, maximum thrust on number one. What's going on? Uh -oh. Yes. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Yes, what's happening? Light uh -oh. Lights started flickering on and off, which I thought was kind of odd, strange. On one engine, the Airbus will not fly at 39,000 feet. They must descend quickly. Try to transfer fuel from center tank and the trim tank. Transferring. Fuel quantity is reaching zero. This can't be. I'm not gonna go completely dry on this airplane. All right. We can't stay at 39,000 feet with just one engine. We'll descend to 33,000 to control our speed. 236 Galagia's tower. We have lost one engine. Engine flame out. Roger, Transat 236. We can see you on primary radar. You are at 135 nautical miles from Lages Field. We are 135 nautical miles from Lages Field. Well, there's a whole lot of critical things go on. In addition to that, you, uh, you turn on all the exterior lights so people can see you're in trouble. You have to broadcast your intentions on an emergency frequency um, so that other people know that you're unable to maintain your altitude. You may, be, you may be descending through their altitude so everybody else is now on the lookout for an airplane that's, that's um, in distress. For the next What's 10 the minutes, the, the stricken Airbus continues on its one remaining engine. The, the pilots still believe that the computer may be partly faulty and that they can make it to Leger's with fuel to spare. In the end, might be all right. Fuel gauge is falling fast, though. It's, it's nearly hitting zero. But 13 minutes after the right-hand engine cut out, and with 130 kilometers still to go, the left engine begins to fail.
We're losing number one. Mayday, mayday, mayday. We have lost both engines due to fuel starvation. We are gliding now. One of the most sophisticated airliners of the modern era, carrying 306 passengers and crew, is now nothing more than a giant glider drifting steadily down towards the ocean. There was no sound in that plane, in that cabin at all. A lot of people were praying and um, screaming for God. My wife was a little hysterical. My best friend was in another world. The plane was dead silent, except for the people who were, who were very upset. List of functions we've lost. We have no more stabilizer. Blue and yellow hydraulic. No ADR two and three. No anti-skid. No reversers. Rudder trim. Radio HF one and two. Lost With the loss of both engines, we have no electrical system. If the engines aren't running, the generators aren't running. So there's, there's no power on the airplane. There is a, a small device. It's called a ram air turbine. It will deploy from underneath the fuselage near the wing fairing. And it's, it's, it's a small propeller that deploys out the bottom of the fuselage and it spins in the wind. And that small propeller will provide very limited electrical and hydraulic systems to run the aircraft. In other words, although it's a glider, at least it's a controllable glider. Calculate how far we can go with our glide angle, will you? Well, we're now at 30,000 feet at the rate of descent of 2,000 feet per minute. We can hang on, hang on for 14 or 15 minutes. Well, I don't want to die on our honeymoon. I was just trying to calm her down, like try and reassure her that everything would be OK. It's a very big struggle um, to stay calm when you're considering your own death. Without power, the plane loses 1,000 feet in height for every five kilometers it travels forward. They can reach the Azores. But if the pilots get their calculations wrong, they may face a forced landing on the water. I'm not sure we can make it to the Air Transat Flight 236 is now drifting without fuel over the Atlantic. Although their initial calculations show that the plane should make it to Lagez. Captain Pichet must now follow standard emergency procedure for a passenger jet over water. Prepare the cabin. Okay. The cabin's slowly depressurizing. We need to put our oxygen masks on. The loss of engine power means the cabin soon depressurizes. Within probably, I'd say, two minutes, um, I saw flight attendants with life jackets in their hand running down the aisles. And obviously, that was a, a sign of fear. Um, what, you know, what was happening was the first question that popped in my mind. <laughs> you know, you don't really know what to think. Um, but people did start to panic at that point when they were told to put on life jackets. This isn't working. No, it's all right. It doesn't it's work. work. Remain, please keep it calm. It's not working. Hold on. My best friend was talking to his father. His father died three years ago. But he's talking to him because he thought for sure he was going to be joining him. And I just kept the same reiteration. Oh, it's OK. One hand on one leg, one hand on the other. Both their arms clenched to mine, kind of looking at my in-laws, blinking, you know, it's OK, it's nothing. <coughs> I kept thinking that if the plane did hit water, that we would survive. I was so convinced that we would survive no matter what happened to the plane that uh, I was probably delusional. <laughs> Hi, 
fear just suddenly just kicked in from, from my toes to straight up to my head. Um, at that point, they started instructing us and giving us instructions of what to do in this procedure. Um, take off your shoes was one of them. Uh, don't inflate your life jacket uh, until we hit the water. Uh, get into this position when we hit the water. It was a lot of, it wasn't like ifs or maybes. It was, this was going to happen. This is the real deal. Ditching a large passenger jet on the water presents severe hazards. If the Airbus 330 has to make a forced landing, the chances of survival are bleak. In my personal opinion, I don't think these airplanes would make very good boats. Typically, uh, an airplane with a low mounted tail like this, as it enters the water, one of the first things that's going to hit the water is the tail. And it's probably going to be ripped right off. And the fuselage is probably going to open right about in there. In 1996, a Boeing 767 ran out of fuel off the coast of East Africa. Its last moments were caught on amateur video and reveal what happens when an airliner attempts a controlled landing on water. Of the 175 people on the Ethiopian Airways jet, only 50 survived. The chances of it surviving that, a ditching and floating for very long are not very good. If Air Transat Flight 236 has to carry out a similar maneuver, it faces an equally grave outcome. With over 100 kilometers before they reach the Azores, the pilots face a long and difficult maneuver. They need to keep the plane gliding for more than 50 minutes to reach the Azores. There's very little time for any emotions at all. You're just, you're just so focused on the mission at hand. It's a life or death situation, of course, uh, but you know, your intention is to get it there. Uh, you're not thinking about the alternatives, but you're fully focused on, uh, you know, on getting the airplane to its destination. Transat 236 Heavy to Lajes Tower. Lajes Tower receiving Transat 236 Heavy. Do you have us on radar, Transat 236? We have you on primary radar. Confirm you're at 80 miles out. Your heading is good. Transat 236 Heavy Lajes Tower, we are trying to make the runway. Please describe runway, heading, and length. Lajes Tower, Transat 236 Heavy. Runway is 33 and 10,865 feet long. Airport dead ahead on your present heading. Please advise when you have it in sight. Transat 236 Heavy, we cannot see the airport. We will tell you when we can. As the minutes tick by, the long wait for those on board is agonizing. That's it, that's, this is it, this is, it's over. They're just gonna die in the next five to 10 minutes. I had contemplated the idea that we would die, certainly. And kind of, you can, I think in that moment, you can accept it more than you think you would accept it. I never thought I was gonna die. I was in a little bit of a state of distress. I did my best not to show it, uh, to try to keep the cool comma collected, but there was certain times where I wasn't sure if we would make it. The torture of the whole fact that you're gonna die, which I totally thought I was going to, is worse to me than dying. If I'm gonna die, just kill me now. Just just get a gun and shoot me, or just let this plane go down and nosedive into the ocean and then just die instantly. On the ground, emergency services prepare for the crash landing of a fully loaded airliner.
With 20 kilometers to go, the crew now prepare for the most dangerous part of the operation, getting their plane on the runway in one piece. Six heavy Delages Tower, do you have our distance from the threshold now and weather, please? Roger, Transat 236 Heavy. You are eight miles out according to primary radar, airspeed 280 knots according to our reading. Visibility unlimited. You should have the airport in sight. Negative, Lajes Tower. Until now, we cannot see the runway. There is no room for error. Without power, the pilots have only one chance at landing. If they miss or overshoot the runway, the results could be catastrophic. I got it, just to the right. Minimum rat speed is 140 knots, maximum speed for gravity gear extension, 200 knots. I'm not lowering the gear until the last minute, OK? OK. The crew struggled to lose height and speed for landing. Roger, Lajes. Six nautical miles. Let's open the slats. It'll slow us down a bit. Slats out and locked. As they approach the runway, their speed increases dangerously. Too fast, and they can roll off the end of the runway. Lower the gear. Hold on. Speed is about 200. All right. I stabilize the speed. Can you give me a landing speed, please? No engine, no flaps. Ideal approach speed is 170 knots. We're too fast. Yes. But the runway is very long. Captain Pichet now performs a difficult series of swerving maneuvers to slow the plane down for landing. The plane was almost on a like a 45 degree angle. I thought it was just gonna it was just gonna flip over and just nose dive straight down. The plane was circling around the island to slow down. So then we saw land and then we saw water. And when I saw water again, it really struck me that, you know, our chance for survival had maybe was gone. The runway is long. Yeah, sure, but at the end is a 400 foot cliff. If we don't stop in enough time, we're toast. We're dead. The crew line up the giant Airbus for final approach. Landing gear down and locked. Three green. No flaps. Only the emergency brakes. No spoilers, no reverse thrust. 4,000 feet, 195 knots. Three thousand feet, one hundred and ninety seven knots. Two thousand feet, two hundred knots. Alert the cabin. Cabin crew, one minute to landing. Vertical speed at 3,000 feet per minute. We're going way too fast. And the speed's increasing, 203 knots now. It's way too fast. 1,000 feet, 201 knots. I'm trying to get the nose up. We'll ride fast. But even if the crew can get the Airbus on the runway, they face a further problem. Without engines, the normal procedures for braking are severely restricted. For flight 236, the danger is far from over. The pilots must land the plane without power and somehow get it to stop. The 
Airbus hits hard at high speed. The tires have blown. Captain Pichet tries to hold the nose down. After bursting eight tires, the plane finally stops in the middle of the runway. I just wanted to get out of this airplane quickly. I jumped, I hit the ground hard. It's my, I don't think my, my rear end actually even touched the chute at all. I didn't slide down the slide. I ran down it and they're just, get out, get out, get out. So you're just running out of this aircraft. What in God's name just happened? I, I, I fell down to the ground literally and I just started, I started crying. I mean, once you're off the plane and you're evacuated, you wanna know what happened. Pichet and Diego had flown their Airbus without power further than any passenger jets in history. As news of their remarkable achievements spread around the world, they found themselves reluctant heroes. You don't have time really to think about anything else than taking care of the, of the safety of your passenger, you know? That's your main goal, and uh, since we didn't have any engine, the other main goal was to make the landing safely. So at that time, I guess the experience came in, you know, with the help of my colleague, that's why we, that's why we made a successful landing. You train for the worst, but you never know how you'll deal, deal with uh, situations like this. And um, reflecting afterwards, I feel uh, we dealt uh, in the most professional and uh, complete wa matter we could. The feeling of being grateful to see all the passengers uh, were okay. You know, something like this happened. You never know what what is going to happen. Really, I mean, you don't. You stop not to believe it. I mean. Uh, Makes no sense that a big jet with two engines has no more power with 300 people on board, you know. But although the public story was a success, disturbing questions remained. Why had a highly sophisticated airliner run out of fuel? What exactly had happened to Flight 236? Away from the cameras, an accident investigation began immediately by the Portuguese, Canadian and French transport authorities. Initial checks quickly confirmed that all the fuel tanks of the Airbus were indeed empty. But to lose more than 17 tons of fuel in such a short space of time meant they'd had a major leak. The question was, where? Engineers examined the fuel system, searching for faults in the tanks and the fuel lines. It wasn't long before they found what they were looking for, just by the right engine. In this particular case, you had a hydraulic tube that's relatively small by comparison to the larger fuel tube. And the hydraulic tube, due possibly to pulsations in the hydraulic system, were abrading against the larger tube. And eventually the larger tube uh, had a leak in it, and the leak, or not the leak itself, but the, uh, the hole eventually possibly led into a fracture of the tube, allowing this massive fuel flow outside of the engine. The investigators began checking air transit maintenance records. They discovered that on the 17th of August, five days before the flight, air transit had removed the right-hand engine for maintenance and installed a replacement unit sent by Rolls-Royce. But as they analyzed the repair logs for the engine, they uncovered a shocking mistake. This was not a case of faulty design, but of faulty maintenance. Rolls-Royce had supplied the engine without a hydraulic pump assembly. To overcome this, Transat mechanics had used the parts from an older engine. But they didn't fit properly, and the pipes had been rubbing together for five days, until, midway over the Atlantic, one finally broke. The engine was delivered minus these two tubes and a bracket. 
that the purpose of that bracket was to maintain adequate clearance. So if they took the bracket off the old engine and put it on the new engine, is that the pipes would be locked together so that they could possibly abrade. So the, the mechanics, now I, I can't fault them, but they are not given specific instructions to verify the three millimeter clearance. As investigators questioned air transat mechanics, they found more disturbing evidence of malpractice. The chief mechanic testified that he had been concerned about the substitution of another hydraulic assembly. Five days before the accident, he raised his concerns with his superior. He was told that it would cost too much to have the aircraft waiting for the missing parts and to go ahead with the substitution. The replacement parts only differed from the correct ones by a few millimeters, but it was a difference that almost cost 306 lives. A few days after the accident, Air Transat publicly accepted responsibility for the faulty maintenance. We have to realize that there was a small uh, a mistake uh, made uh, in terms of changing the pump. Uh, we installed it, uh, but then uh, some, some, some uh, pipes, uh, so to speak, uh, were needed to be connected to the pump, and there was a mismatch. The immediate consequences for Air Transat in that event was that they got to pay a fine of a quarter of a million dollar, which was the highest ever in Canada, for an error that could have been prevented. How someone that is supposed to be qualified in their job can put the wrong part onto an engine and risk 300 people's lives is, is, is beyond me. This incident is a very strong reminder that regulation is important and safety is important and lives will be lost in the absence of that. And they're real lives. It's not just, you know, this imaginary figure in your head of 300 people. It's real people who suffer and continue to suffer. As a result. If it hadn't have been us suffering, it would have been our families. This was by no means the end of the story. Investigators now turn their attention to the cockpit itself. What role had the crew played in the events of August the 24th? Could they have done more to avert the crisis? Key questions remained unanswered. Questions about what happened on the flight deck. The investigation into Air Transat Flight 236 discovered that basic maintenance errors had led to the fuel leak. Air Transat accepted responsibility and were heavily fined. But the focus now turned on the flight deck and the performance of the crew. What part did they play in the fuel loss? Wing cross feed. On. On. When the crew opened the cross feed valve to transfer fuel from the left wing tank to the right, they lost 17 tons of fuel in less than 30 minutes yet they failed to close the cross-feed valve and prevent further loss. Mayday, mayday, mayday. We have lost both engines due to fuel starvation. We are gliding now. In the days after the incident, Captain Robert Pichet and Dirk de Jaeger were called before the inquiry and asked in detail about their actions. More than two years later, these findings have still not been published. What follows are possible explanations for the course of events that night, based on known facts and expert opinion. I temp low and oil pressure high on number two. The warnings of high oil pressure and low oil temperature from the engine on the right wing would not have led the pilots to suspect that there was already a major fuel leak. The indications that were being presented uh, with respect to the oil system would probably not give the crew any indications. Uh, um, they may have questioned what was causing uh, the, the erroneous or strange indications 
uh, but uh, there's nothing certainly in, in my mind or their training I think that would have uh, triggered them to suspect that uh, you know, a fuel system might be involved. Bet you it's a computer problem. But although the pilots thought they had a computer error, the oil warnings were actually correct and were the first indication of a much more serious problem. Fuel imbalance warning. I haven't seen that before. When the fuel imbalance warning came up 20 minutes later, showing less fuel in the right wing than the left, it seemed unconnected with the oil alarms. This could have reinforced Captain Pichet's idea that he was facing a series of computer errors. Do not apply this procedure if a fuel leak is suspected. Despite his doubts, Captain Pichet was obliged to follow Airbus procedure to correct the imbalance. He opened the crossfeed valve. Wing crossfeed. On. But was following the checklist enough? You just can't. Uh idly flip switches in response to commands from the computers and anticipate that all will be well at the end of it. You know, the, once the checklist is complete, uh, we can sit there fat, dumb, and happy. Uh, that's not the case uh, at all. You know, you, you, you got to keep second-guessing it. You know, is that right? Did we do the right checklist? Have we got the results that we need? Once the pilots calculated the high rate of fuel loss, they should have suspected a major leak. Transat 236 Heavy declaring fuel emergency. By the time they had confirmed the leak, their options were severely limited. They were flying blind, as it were. There was, there was no checklist information provided to them. They assumed that once they had engaged in this procedure that the situation would resolve itself, and it wasn't. Uh, now they had a choice. Uh, do I close the cross feed and, uh, and see what happens? Or do I leave the cross feed open as, as the, as the uh, fuel and balance checklist has, has dictated and maybe the situation will correct itself? The, the crew wasn't really sure. Uh, it wasn't uh, an eventuality. That, uh, it wasn't a situation that they had been trained for, I'm sure. Um, they, were, they, were, they were in new ground with, with really uh, no guidance to, uh, to help them. If, uh, if they left the cross feed open or whether they closed the cross feed, I could, I would, I would only be speculating as to what the, uh, uh, as to what changes uh, it might have uh, resulted in the outcome in this event. Captain Pichet believed for a long time that he was facing a computer error. It was only when the engines finally stopped that he had to accept the fuel leak was genuine. The technological complexity of modern aircraft can help to make them safer and more reliable but it can also lead to the problems that nearly brought catastrophe to Air Transat 236. Discrepancies in replacement parts led to a fuel leak. Distrust of computers led the crew to misread the situation. These errors combined to have huge implications. Only because air traffic control initially sent the plane 60 miles south to avoid congestion was flight 236 close enough to the Azores when the crisis struck. Otherwise, it would have had to ditch in the ocean. The investigation remains unpublished. Airbus blamed the pilots for mishandling the fuel leak. Robert Pichet and Dirk de Jaeger continued to fly with Air Transat. In August 2002, they received the highest honors of the Airline Pilots Association for the longest glide ever accomplished in a passenger airline. After the accident, Airbus modified its checklist in the event of fuel imbalance. From now on, the computer checks all the fuel levels on board against the flight plan. It now gives a clear warning if more fuel is being lost than the engines can consume. Rolls-Royce has reissued a service bulletin, alerting all its clients of the incompatibility of two almost similar parts. For the passengers trapped on flight 236, the trauma has left them with mixed feelings. All right, I stabilized the speed. Uh, this accident wasn't, wasn't caused by simply uh, one omission by any one individual, uh, as is typical of most aircraft accidents. Uh, there's a whole chain of events, a whole series of, of events that, that lead to, to the incident or to the accident, and uh, this accident was no different.
Whatever the circumstances are, uh, the pressure that he was under is tremendous. He, he got that plane down safely, only blew out eight of the 12 tires, <laughs> and saved 300 people. He saved 300 people's lives. Captain Pichet saved our lives, and um, whether or not he made an error, um, or if there was a failure of a computer, it doesn't really matter because we're alive. <laughs> Do I think he's a hero? No. Do I think he's a hell of a pilot? Yes. Thank God the islands of the Azores were there and basically saved our lives. But if that fuel pump uh, broke two, five minutes beforehand, we'd, we would have ended up into, into the water. And I probably wouldn't be here to tell the story.